and welcome to Conversations With. I'm Courtney. And I'm Keith. And we are the clinical team here at Burton's Academy. With our combined passion for monitoring and ventilation, we're here to rewind and remind you on the foundations and principles used to form the knowledge and understanding in everyday anaesthesia. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us on our second episode of Series 3 where we are going to continue our discussion on oxygen. If you remember, part 1, 2 and 3 of so the first half of Series 3 is all going to be on oxygen. Um, last week we talked about how we can deliver it to our patient and then this week I'm joined by Keith and we are talking about oxygen from the lungs to the mitochondria, so about diffusion and how it basically gets from the source that we give it to our patient and then right down so that our patient can use it. So welcome, Keith. Yeah. Hello, Courtney. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so now we've we've arrived at this um, state where we, from last week, we discussed about how we get oxygen actually into the lungs. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, we're going to look at how that oxygen gets from the lungs, you know, through the um, alveolar barrier into the blood, through the blood uh, stream, down to the tissues, through the tissue itself, and then, you know, eventually ending up at the mitochondria. Um, and maybe we should just start with the mitochondria just as a concept and think about what this is all about. Why do we need oxygen anyway? And one of the first things is that you cannot store oxygen in the body very well. You know, there's no there's no store there. You, know, you can store fat, you can store potential sources of energy, but you can't store oxygen. So um, this poses the problem. Um, and then the only way you can store energy transiently is in this thing called ATP. I just want to quite mention ATP because it comes up in your Krebs cycle when you do it at, at college and you think, oh, yeah, this is all very interesting, but what does it actually mean? Well, this is partly what we're talking about today. We want to get oxygen from the lungs down to this mitochondria. They're going to process it. They're going to metabolize oxygen. Uh, sorry, they metabolize glucose with oxygen um, or some form of sugar and produce energy, CO2, water, and that's not a single step. That's a many, many, many steps. And in that process, it's producing lots of ATP. If I remember rightly, I think uh, you get 38 molecules of ATP for each um, molecule of sugar, something like that. So ATP is uh, formed by phosphorylating ADP. You just put one more phosphorus on the on this um, um, molecule, and that's a big lump of energy and you restored it there as ATP and then later on when you want it in the cell you you borrow it back again you take your ATP you convert it back to ADP and there's your energy that can enable you to do things in the cell so that's what it's all about we just got to get oxygen now down there so that these little mitochondria can start producing ATP um, so that's the big problem um, you know we, we start off with you know 100 millimeters or more of uh, partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs and we're down to two, three millimeters of oxygen partial pressure in the tissues. So that's a big drop. And of course, you can imagine that if you lose some at the, the top end, and like if you don't have 100 millimeters or so of uh, oxygen, you're not going to get the same down the other end. And that's where things start to go wrong. So we're going to start to look at that today. Um, so we start with the lungs. Um, and we have to think about the lungs as a conducting and, a, and a, um, an exchange tissue and some sort of facts that stick in the brain from from college um there, i think in dogs and humans and horses there are about 23 levels of division you know so you go trachea major bronchi bronchioles whatever so you've got about 23 layers of, of division and the first 15 16 are all non-conducting so we talked about dead space in another podcast that's all the dead space and then below about a level level 16 17 you've got these um what they start to call conducting airways. So you've actually got some airways which have um, what they call this transitional respiratory zone. So you've got some alveoli hanging off the um, off the sides of them, but they're not fully um, uh, uh, populated with alveoli. They still got some non-exchange surfaces, and that gets um, less and less the, the the sort of non-exchange surface down to level 23, 24, where you've actually got the um, the alveoli but what's really interesting is is the cross-sectional area obviously gets you know bigger and bigger and bigger and you hear about things like the lungs got the area of a tennis court or that sort of thing well, i mean it's got a massive area the reason i'm going on about this is what it actually means is by the time you get down to those alveoli there's hardly any flow all the flow has 
been very high up in the trachea, bronchioles, and what have you. When you get down to the alveoli, it's hardly moving at all, and it's more or less a diffusion process, which I think I find quite interesting because you think about these these alveoli expanding and, and collapsing, you think there's got airs rushing in, but actually, flow down at that level is is really um, minimal, and it's more or less done by diffusion. So I think um, that just kind of puts it in into context, really. Um, so we need to think about oxygen. So let's think about oxygen in air. Um, and in air, we've got 21% oxygen and atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. So if you do the math, you end up with about 160 millimeters of oxygen in air, something like that as a partial pressure. So that's where that's at the point where we breathe in and then it goes into the lungs and then you get this humidification effect because there's water vapor in in the uh, air that's in our lungs. So that drops it down a little bit to about 150 millimeters of mercury. And then we've got we're going to meet the lung tissue that's full of CO2 or you know, full of that's, that's it. Um, slightly incorrect is there are <laughs> large amounts of CO2 um, and so that's going to reduce the partial pressure also. So now we're down to 100 millimetres of mercury thereabouts for, for a sort of um, normal resting uh, individual. So you can see that we've got this, what's called the oxygen cascade starting here. We started off at 160, we're already down to 100 millimetres of mercury. And we've only actually just got to the alveolus. Um, we haven't even crossed the barrier. So just to give you some reference points then, we would say that um, for standard uh, patient breathing room air, um, we would have 100 millimeters of mercury of uh, oxygen in the, in the alveolus, and that would roughly translate to 100 millimeters of mercury in the artery, and that would represent about 97%, 98% of oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin. And then just to, again, put that back into context, by the time it's gone around the body, lost its oxygen, and it loses about 25% of its oxygen. We'll come back, and then... We're going to have about 40 millimeters of mercury oxygen in the venous system, and that creates about 70-75% saturation. So, so that's the circle. We pick up oxygen through the hemoglobin, and then we lose about 25% of it, and we come back with about 70-75% um, saturation and a much lower oxygen level in the venous system. So and that, that kind of starts to beg another question then. How how does that oxygen get carried around the body? So I think we touched on this briefly last week. Um, but if you if you remember correctly, it's not all in the um, dissolved mm. oxygen in the blood. In, in fact, you, you can only dissolve a certain amount in the blood. It's really all about this hemoglobin. Um, and I think hemoglobin is a, a fascinating structure. Um, I'm going to go, go a bit sort of, Techie here and a bit, bit uh, sort of nerdy, but what really, really is really interesting. I don't know if you know, but the, the that tetrapyrrole ring that forms hemoglobin. Do you know where else it's found? Have Ooh. you read this? Oh gosh, oh, I feel like I'm I'm in an exam. Um, no, but maybe as soon as you say it, my brain will go. You know, it will go to the back of my head, and they'll be like, "Oh, there's that little wee fact that you knew that you parked." Um, okay, no, where else is it found? No, it's, I think it's really fascinating. So we got hemoglobin, yeah. So uh, mammals, um, you know, the animal kingdom, but the plant kingdom has chlorophyll, oh. and chlorophyll <laughs> is a tetrapyral ring, but it has magnesium at its centre instead of iron. But otherwise, it does the same thing in plants that hemoglobin does in, hum in you know, in the animal kingdom. I think that's yeah, just that amazing. Fascinating. That is, you know, that is fascinating. And I can tell you confidently that wasn't in the back of my mind, but now it always will. Hopeful for a pub quiz or something like that, I can bring it <laughs> yeah, up. <laughs> yeah, it's good just for pub quiz stuff. Yeah. But I, thought, I always thought that was really, so somewhere, you know, the, the divergent evolution or whatever's, whatever's happened here, you know, that, that, that development of the hemoglobin molecule has gone parallel to the development of the chlorophyll molecule. One deals with oxygen in plants, and one deals with oxygen in in the animal kingdom. So I think, anyway, it doesn't help. Is, it doesn't help. Oh, yes, yeah, doesn't help you on a day to day basis at all. But it's just kind of like quite quite interesting, really. Yeah, no, so, that really is. So we'll stick with the, we'll stick with the hemoglobin molecule, um, and yeah, we're, obviously hemoglobin is what carries oxygen. Um, we have to understand a little bit about how it's carried because the, the nature and the way it's carried does, 
does have clinical implications. So, I mean, you can read all the books and it gets very, very technical about all these um, amine chains and what have you. Basically, there's just a couple of alpha chains, a couple of beta chains. Um, all we need to know is that hemoglobin has two states, a relaxed state and a tense state, as it's called. And in the relaxed state, it will take up oxygen and hold four, each molecule of hemoglobin will hold four molecules of oxygen. But it, the very first time it binds that first oxygen molecule, it, 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 it actually changes its conformation and it means it can bind the next one even easier. And then the next one, and then finally the fourth one is even easier to bind. Um, and the relative affinity for oxygen in the, the relaxed state versus the tense state is actually 500 times. I mean, it's massive. So this thing is geared to, it's like a little mouse trap, really. You know, you touch it and it snaps. So you, you throw a little oxygen molecule at its and its gateway at its mouth, and it's like a Venus flytrap, and it just grabs it and then and then sets off this chain of events that really just suck oxygen into it. I mean, it's it's amazing. So so that's what happens in the lungs. This the hemoglobin molecule comes back. It's been carrying some carbon dioxide, and we'll talk about that in the second part of this series when we start to talk about carbon dioxide. Anyway, releases its CO2, starts this process to grab oxygen, binds all those four molecules and goes into the into the relaxed state. Now it's carrying oxygen. So that then gives us um, hemoglobin bound to oxygen, leaves the lungs and goes off to the body. Now we're gonna we're gonna follow that later, but we got a lot of things to think about before that oxygen molecule got from the alveolus to to the blood. And just some things to think about for um, practical purposes. So, <clears throat> carbon dioxide and CO2 are the predominant molecules we're, we're thinking about in the lungs. And I'm going to put you on the spot here again, Courtney. I'm going to oh, see no. you, can you can you remember the relative sort of solubilities of carbon dioxide and oxygen? Um, how, how much is one more soluble than the other? And what inf what influence does that have on the ability for um, either of them to diffuse across the the lung blood barrier? Well, goodness. Um, I do remember that oxygen diffuses a lot quicker and more freely, doesn't it? Than CO2? Uh, sorry, what did I say? So CO2, no, CO2 diffuses more quicker and readily than oxygen. Yay! Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I think it's, um, I think it's probably... Um, not something that's very well explained or 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 made um, anything of, but it's about twenty times as, as um, more soluble. So that in most instances, you know, if you've got lung pathology, the first thing that's going to be affected is oxygen transport. Mm -hmm. So if you've got some thickening of the alveolar um, uh, lining, or you've got some ex exudate, or you've got some uh, interstitial fluid, or pneumonia, whatever, that's going to change the oxygen uh, diffusion, um, and we would. Uh, there's a, a saying that it's you know, diffusion limited, you know, where actually the oxygen ability to get into the blood is diffusion limited, whereas CO2 isn't diffusion limited. So I do remember a few cases actually where we've potentially, we've, you know, we've taken a blood gas from a patient that has appeared dyspneic and we've looked at their CO2 and gone, oof, that's high. And then we've looked at the oxygen and gone, that is so low. We need to ventilate. We need to put this patient on mechanical ventilation for a few days now. Mm. So it wasn't the CO2 that made us go, oh, it's a bit high. It was more like, okay, there's, we are massively you know, a patient is not getting any oxygen and let's mechanically ventilate this patient. So that's yeah. where, that's where I guess what you've just said, um, you know, the first thing that is affected is, or the, you know, one of the most important things that is affected is, is the oxygen, not the so oxygen. much that high level of CO2. It's not, it wasn't ideal that we had a high level of um, PaCO2 and perhaps we're getting an acidemia because of that. It was more, heck, there is no oxygen in this patient. This has been massively affected. Yes, yeah, and so th those cases are are ones where, you know, breathing room air um, will lead to them being uh, uh, hypoxic, you know, having a true um, hypoxic hypoxia because they just have, can't get the oxygen across. Um, and if it's um, if it's purely, we talked about it last time, if it's purely hypoventilation, then just increasing the oxygen 
tension or, or inspired oxygen fraction by a few percent to 30 percent will overcome any of those hyperventilation problems. But once you start to hit um, diffusion limitations because of this fluid, then you've got to mm. increase the oxygen tensions massively. But we tend to go for 100 percent, don't we, or, or whatever our oxygen concentrator is throwing out, you know, 90 percent plus anyway. So it's it's massively elevated. So, yeah, so so you see that as the limiting factor rather than CO2. Mm. And these were these were patients with aspiration pneumonia. Um, so, yeah, they obviously had that diffusion issue there. They just didn't have that nice one level, one cellular level, healthy alveoli to go back and forth, back and forth. It was just full of gunk, I guess. Yeah, and I think another, another fact, these little facts stick in your mind that the distance normally between an um you know the edge of an alveolus and a, a red blood cell is about three to four microns micrometers um but of course it doesn't take much to get some interstitial inflammation and um fluid development and that can easily you know double or, or triple and then of course that diffusion path is very much longer it may only be six or eight microns but it's it's big deal compared to what it was um not for co2 but definitely for oxygen Mm -hmm. So, so there's one of our our limitations, um, and then you know we're talking about hemoglobin. Um, we've obviously got the other forms of hemoglobin. So, our pulse ox is going to pick up a saturation percentage, which is looking for oxyhemoglobin, um, and that's going to um, give us a percentage saturation of that. But um, as we know, there are other forms of hemoglobin, and again, I think when you go through college, you think, oh, these. This is interesting, but are they relevant? Well, the only the other two I think worth talking about really are met hemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. Um, and we all have a bit of met hemoglobin in our in our bodies, and I think it runs at a level between sort of two and five percent, um, and is rarely of any consequence. Um, but I think, Courtney, you, you came across a case recently. I think that you were you were aware of or. Um, had some involvement with, which was uh, massive elevations of methemoglobin. I think that's quite interesting because that case shows that it's clinically relevant and um, it just sort of underlines and starts to explain what we're about to talk about with the um, carriage of oxygen. So what was that case about? So this was a case shared um, kind of in a group chat with some colleagues that I used to work with at a at a large referral hospital, and it was a patient that was actually in the recovery phase and became dyspneic. Um, and they thought, okay, what's what's happening here? It's had a spinal surgery. It surely hasn't affected anything around the structures that innervate the diaphragm or anything like that. You know, it was a it was a hemilaminectomy, so it had to be further down than than up in the cervical neck region. So it was a patient that became dyspneic, so they took a blood sample, they ran it through the um, blood gas machine, and they actually found that this patient had um, high levels of this met hemoglobin. And thought, okay, there's, you know, there's a few reasons why this, this might happen. Um, and it turns out that this patient had not long ago received paracetamol. Um, okay. And, and you know, and there's a few drugs that actually, if we give an excess, we can get this met hemoglobin forming. So it, is, it can be with paracetamol. It can also be with local anesthetics as well. Um, and there's actually a case study of a, of some Pomeraniums. They can also have this hereditary congenital met hemoglobin. But yeah, it was it was a case of kind of a paracetamol affecting how this patient's hemoglobin turned to met hemoglobin. Right. Okay. And of course, by I think what's uh, you know subtly understated is become by be forming met hemoglobin, it's it's no longer oxyhemoglobin. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So it changes the ion. Is it the uh, so normally we've got an F E two plus? Is it? Um, That's right. You you have the ferrous and the ferric form. Yes, and it just changes changes from the ferrous to the ferric, so it becomes the one F E three. Yeah, and, and the ferric form isn't isn't uh, usable. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's what happened with this pooch. It, you know, it, it looked like it had a normal uh, PaO2 or it was a venous sample. So um, it was a little bit high because it was receiving some supplementation oxygen just while they're thinking, why is this patient dyspneic? So actually on paper, you looked at it and I thought, OK, the total hemoglobin looks looks great. It's got hemoglobin there of all different kinds. Um, it's got oxygen in the arterial system. Fantastic. 
But actually, when you went further down the blood gas and you saw this met hemoglobin value, um, it was just over 20%. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, presuming it didn't have a very high value to start with, it's lost, you know, 20% rough figures of its normal hemoglobin. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, carrying capacity. So that that must mean as that's an effect of if you lose hemoglobin, that's really an anemia, isn't it? You know, a, a same sort of effect as an anemia. You just have lost yeah. that carrying capacity of blood. Yeah. Um you've only got a little bit that can dissolve in in um in the plasma. So it has to be the hemoglobin that's carrying it. And we've lost it because it's been converted to hemoglobin. So I think, yeah, when I when I went through university, you read about these things, you learned about these things and you think, oh yeah, I don't that's an interesting, but I don't see how that applies. But I think particularly with the use of intravenous paracetamol now is becoming more and more uh, frequent. That's uh, something to look out for. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is um, you know, carbon monoxide um, has a tremendous affinity for hemoglobin. Um, and I think not so relevant, but but I have, you know, I was working in... Um, uh, when I was working in large animal practice in Biddeford, I went to a tender fire where um, we'd been on a farm and we had lots of um, calves um, that were in the fire that had smoke inhalation and um, and they were definitely um, cherry red uh, membranes because they had carboxy wow. uh, hemoglobin. Um, so, it, you know, again, it does happen. Um, and in the, you know, that was a that was a livestock farm animal situation. We couldn't really put all of those in oxygen tents and things. Um, but uh, that, you know, those things can happen. So if you see dogs, cats, rabbits from fire, you know, um, buildings from fires, and even I, I, I've read this, but I've never seen it. Um, supposedly, in in households where um, where there's heavy smokers, you actually get uh, high levels of carbon monoxide. You know, um, passive smoking really. Oh. Yeah, I, I say I read it. It, it. This is a medical report um, that, that's you know showed that um, individuals in households where, where there are heavy smokers did have raised levels of carboxyhemoglobin. Anyway, slightly straying off the path. So, uh, but but kind of indicating that we need all the hemoglobin we can get, and things like emet hemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin are going to detract from that. So, so we've picked up our our oxygen. And our hemoglobin is in this happy, happy, relaxed state, and then it's going to travel now down to to the target tissues. And it's quite interesting that you think, well, what happens along the way? Can it not lose its oxygen on the way? Is it not? But it can't really, if you think about it. If you remember the histology of of the aorta and the big arteries and the, and the arterioles, they all have non-porous walls, um, so they can't lose any oxygen until they get to the um, uh, down to the tissues, so it's like getting on a um, underground train, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like you know you get on the underground, and you, you, where all you know the passengers, all the oxygen molecules, on they get onto the hemoglobin, and then you can't get off to the next station because there is no exit path. So that's a nice yeah. way of thinking of it. So yeah, so you, uh, until you get to that uh, next station, you can't get off, and the next station is the tissue, and then you got the potential to to lose oxygen or un unleash the oxygen there. So um, this oxygen, sorry, this hemoglobin is in its happy state all the way down to its tissues, and then something happens to upset it, you know, and, and by upset it, changes environment, the environment suddenly changes, it ends up in this tissue um, where things are changed. So we, it's noticeably warmer now, we're in the sort of core, core tissue as opposed to lungs, which are just pulling in room air all the time. It's just warmer. Um, and it's now in tissue that's been actively respiring, producing CO2, so we're in a slightly increased CO2 environment. Because of that, we're in an in, you know, increased proton H plus environment, so our pH is down. So all those things really upset hemoglobin, and it just basically says, whoa, I'm out of here, and it just goes into its tense state and bungs off the oxygen. So it releases the oxygen because of that, that, that change, okay? And then CO2 has been sitting there, CO2 always gets the bad boy image, doesn't it? It is kind of a <laughs> bad boy, really, um, because what it does is it, 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 it plays its part 
in displacing that oxygen. So it displaces the oxygen, binds to the hemoglobin, because those those conditions are preferential. And then we've lost our oxygen and we've we've gained our CO2. Um, and my kind of way to think about it is, when it got to that tube station, okay, and the doors opened, I'm not a football, I'm not a football fan at all, but we had like, and I'm going to get criticised for this now. I know. We're going to have like <laughs> on the on the platform, we had like a little Millwall fans, and then and on in, in the in the um, in the carriage itself, we got a load of other. I don't know who, who Millwall would hate, but anyway, they would rush in the CO2 boys, the Millwall boys would rush into the into the train compartment, and because of the antisocial nature of these football fans, all the good people would rush out and leave the tram. So this is my this is my analogy for 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 what happens down. This is the Bohr effect. This is the Bohr effect. So all these football fans, these antisocial football fans, onto the train, all the good. Um, well-behaved fans all rush out, which is all the oxygen, because the environment has changed. They were happy in their character. They were very happy when they got on at, at Green Park, um, you know, in, in London. They'd had their cream tea, happy boys and girls. Get down to to this other station, faced with this changed environment, and they rush out. So I like to think that's a nice way to think about the changing environment. And oh. this all comes to... This leads us to the oxygen dissociation curve, yeah? Yes. Because that's yeah. what it's all about. <laughs> I wish you had taught me this. I wish you were like my lecturer 15 years ago telling me that that's how, you know, if you just used that analogy for me 15 years ago, I would be away sailing. That is such a brilliant way to remember it. And I'm just over really here laughing because I know the trauma of when you pull up to a, to a tube station and all of these rowdy, negative, whatever fans they are, rush in and you think, oh, God, I'm getting out of here. Yeah. So I say apologies to anybody who supports Mill. <laughs> I don't know why I picked on Mill. Um, but um, it does describe, I think it describes it in a, in a, in a graphical way. So you kind of remember the whole oxygen, the, 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 the you know, getting on other lungs. The carriage is very receptive, you know, go down to your next station and the whole environment changes the carriage becomes unreceptive to oxygen so you're going to get off yeah mm -hmm. so we've got this oxygen dissociation curve and again i think most people can picture the oxygen dissociation curve it's kind of like a sigmoid curve um and i remember studying this and, and kind of struggling with it a bit because it didn't it didn't seem to me to describe what i wanted it to describe because what i wanted it to to do was if i looked at the High PO2 on the bottom, I'd see this high high percentage um, oxygen. If I looked lower down, uh, lower PO2, I see a lower percentage oxygen. But it didn't tell me what was going on, why the oxygen was released, because there was no changes there. So it's kind of misleading, I think, because that curve only applies to those conditions of pH temperature CO2 at that point. And what we're really looking at is we're looking at if you take the standard curve, you're looking at in the lungs, one that's displaced slightly to the left. And in the tissues, you're looking at one displaced slightly to the right relative to that standard curve. And it's that displacement that causes the, the difference. Um, it, I mean, you know, again, very, very clever uh, engineering from, from nature and in the way you know, it, it handles this picking up of oxygen. Because you remember the top of the curve, where we get to, you know, nearly 98, 99% saturation, it gets flat at that point, yeah? And that's at around about the point of your 160 millimeters mercury where you are in the lungs, but it's nice and flat. So actually, if for whatever reason you're you're running or you're, or you're not breathing as well as you could be and you're not bringing in quite as much oxygen and your PO2 drops a little bit, it's on such a flat part of the curve there that it won't change the oxygen saturation at all. So it's a very neat, buffer there for, for mild variations in oxygen coming into the lights, it won't actually drop the, the saturation much at all. And then when you get down into those tissues, as I say, it shifts everything to the right. And that, that shift means that it has to let go of its oxygen. Um, and then that's how it releases into the tissue. And, and at the same time, it will then bind CO2. So clinically, what does that mean? Um, well, I think it means that um, 
we just need to understand the difference between what's going on in the lungs and what's going on in tissue, yeah, and the effect of pH. So, um, and temperature. So things like, things that move it to the right, move that dissociation curve to the right are, as I said, temperature, pH, CO2. But temperature, everything's warmer in the, in the tissues. And particularly their exercise in tissues. So again, I know we're talking about anesthesia now, but just to uh, um, illustrate a point, if you've got a hypothermic animal, you've got increased metabolism, you've got increased temperature, you are getting, nature's providing oxygen to the to the muscles and things that actually need it because that increased temperature is a result of respiration. It, it, the demand is higher. So the actual re unleashing of oxygen is higher. So that, that shift to the right does have some, some real clinical benefits. Okay. So when you look at an oxygen dissociation curve, um, which you don't do on a daily day basis, do you? So how do you use it? I mean, I have in my mind um, a couple of a couple of points. I don't know if um, you carry these in your head, Courtney, but with a PO2 of, uh, or, or with a saturation of 97%, I think, okay, my PO2 is going to be in a normal animal, you know, 100 millimeters of mercury, yeah? And I know that venous blood is 75% um, saturation, and that's a PO2 of 40. So I, um, those two values in my head give me my, my range, yeah? So if I see a PO2 of 60, I know that actually I'm really approaching Venus. So I'm at, you know, what, what I would expect to be Venus. So I haven't got sufficient oxygenation. And that PO2 of 60 is going to be reflected by a, a, a low pulse ox saturation. Yeah. So this is where pulse oximetry starts to help us. Um, and maybe there's one thing to think about. How useful is a pulse oximeter? And mm -hmm. I think the answer to that question is, depends what your animal's breathing, you know? If it's breathing 100% um, oxygen, then it's probably not very useful in terms of identifying hypoventilation very quickly. That will probably show up as, as a high end tidal CO2 if you've got hypoventilation. But if you're breathing 21% oxygen, room air, then that's, it's quite likely that that pulse ox will pick up the low saturation before you see a change in, in CO2. So it really does depend on the situation. Now, most of the time, our patients are um, anesthetized and have high levels of oxygen supplied to them. So the pulse ox is a limited value, but where it does have real value is when you're, when you're weaning them off, when you go from 100% to 21% and you put them in the case, that's really where pulse ox comes into its own, you know. So, You've worked on, I think, a number of practices, Courtney. How many practices that you work in have that practice of maintaining and keeping the pulse ox on the animal at disconnection and carriage to the case, to the to recovery? I think way back when, I think when I was doing my general nursing for you know the first half of my career, there's that relief when you turn off the the vaporizer, that you disconnect all of the attachments to that patient, you flip them, you know, they've been on 100% oxygen, they've been on isoflurane, you know, 1.5%, the surgeon's done, you you want your lunch break, you need to go to the loo, you've got another case to do, you flick everything off, you turn that patient over and you put them back in the recovery kennel and away you go. Every now and then you flip the lip and see what colour their mucous membranes are. And I think that probably was the extent of what I would be doing in the recovery period for that patient. And I, now, now after, you know, sticking my head in textbooks for years and then thinking, wait, we can actually use this piece of equipment all through the recovery period. Why are we rushing to disconnect everything so quickly? And I'm actually a huge advocate now, um, you know, the second half of my career, Courtney, of having a little portable Pulse ox for recovery now. It is it is a thing I want in that room. I I really want to be monitoring my patients' oxygen saturation and recovery. I think we do still have those those drugs that will cause respiratory depression on board. You know, we turned off the isoflurane and the sevoflurane, fine, but we've still got opioids on on board. We still um, we might even have a really cold patient that is hypoventilating as well, mm -hmm. or, or maybe they're shivering as well. Like shivering 
costs the body so much uh, in like metabolic money, for example, you know, it just by shivering, you increase the oxygen demand. What is it? Something like 300 to 400% just so those muscles can all move, 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 move and warm up. And I think, okay, so th- these are the patients that were on really nice 100%. Within three seconds, we've turned it all off. We've flipped them over. Um, we've got them on room air. They might be a bit cold. They've still got res- resp- uh, respiratory depressant drugs on board. Um, maybe there's a de- some degree of atelectasis from positioning that they were laying in. And then we just crack on with the next case and we forget to look, go back and look at these patients. And now for me, I think, you know, these little handhold handheld pulse oxes, they're so cheap and I will want one in my recovery room now. And I also, just if we are going to talk about using a pulse ox in the recovery period, I think if possible, not always possible for some patients that are a bit wound up and excited or maybe they're a stress break and develop, but I like trying to obtain a pre-surgical pulse ox reading, if possible, just to help guide my expectations in recovery. Because often we think we've got these brachycephalic patients. We know they're probably going to be a little bit hypoxemic. We're recovering them and then we put these pulse ox probes on these French bulldogs and we go, oh, their pulse ox is 92%. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's probably 92 before we started. Like we yeah. can't we can't make that any better. So now I think the old, old Courtney... I was just waking these patients up, going from this really nice, you know, 100% oxygen down to a fifth of what we were providing without much else changing in terms of drugs on board and and temperature. Um, And now wanting to have these pulse oxes on the tongue, on the toe, you know, taped around the tail to the coccygeal artery if I was worried. So now I'm, I'm a big fan of using them in the recovery period. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's, you know, always been the same. The operation finishes, everything comes off, but in the cage and you, you know, observe its recovery. But that's really where there's a high danger period, isn't there, for, for things to go wrong. You know, you, they don't do it in human medicine and, you know, we should really be doing it. But I think it just highlights by looking at these these figures how vulnerable the patient is to things like hypoxia and hypercapnia, um, you know, basically hypoventilation in that recovery mm. period. Yeah. Um, and there was the, um, I mean, I'm sure many people might have heard the term SEPSAF, or the big, mm. big um, morbidity mortality study that was performed um, where they looked at, you know, almost, almost something like 100,000 dog and 100,000 cat anesthetics. And they did find that those that were going to have an anesthetic related death, you know, some, because like we've done half of those were happening in recovery and yeah. hypoxemia, that was a... That's a, one of the, there's about seven or eight, you know, these are things that go wrong in recovery and why they die, and hypoxemia was one of them. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's probably purely high, hypoventilation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay, so we, our little uh, oxygen molecules got a little bit further into the, into the uh, system. Um, another sort of random thing to think about Um it is, and it's stuck in my brain, is that hypoxia kills animal quite quickly. But hypercapnia kills them slowly. So, you know, we really, we really do need to act and, and observe and detect hypoxia far more than we need to um, detect hypercapnia in terms of time and speed of reaction. But the thing is, the reason for that is that, as I said at the beginning, you've got no oxygen reserves. So you, if the, if there's no oxygen, say, um, you know, there's a there's a, a cessation of breathing, or whatever. Um, there's no reserves in the body. You've only got three minutes of of oxygen in the, you know, what remains in the spleen, the functional residual capacity, the the vessels themselves. You've only got three minutes, and the brain itself, because it's super oxygen user. You only got ten to fifteen seconds before you lose consciousness there, so we really got to guard against um, hypoventilation and, and hypoxia. And we'll come on a little bit later to talk about different forms of hy- hypoxia. But just to, to make the point again, you know, that hypoxia is something that will, will kill an animal quickly, um, and um, hypercapnia will, will do it slowly. So you've got much more time with a hypercapnic patient. Um, and we have to think of also about um, the effect of age, you know, I think we all intuitively think, oh, it's an older dog. We better be a bit more careful. We won't give it quite so much before. We won't give it quite so much. I say we won't, you know, you tend to back off a bit, don't you? And there's some good reasons, I think, you know, 
uh, looking at the, the the studies and the data, um, the natural fall in PO2 occurs with age. Um, some of these figures I got here are from human studies, but um, a 25 year old has an average PO2 in the uh, arterial PO2 of 94 millimeters of mercury. Healthy um, adult, 25 years old. A healthy 80 year old has a PO2 of 74, just by virtue of the changing um, nature of the lung tissue over time. And that's going to be mirrored in our in our older patients too. So again, we're up against it. Um, you, know, you need to say that older patient and it's already got a, a much higher alveolar to arterial oxygen difference um, uh, than a younger dog. So that's going to limit its oxygen carrying capacity and its, um, and its oxygen saturation um, as well. Um, okay. One of the other things we can think about is before we, you know, before we get any further again, is to just think about the lung itself. And I know there's a whole range of different people listening to this from from nurses that may be on training courses to nurses that are in advanced sort of um, uh, education. So I think it might be fair just to start thinking a little bit about things like VQ mismatches. Um, and I hope you would kind of endorse this, Courtney, that 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 these aren't esoteric. These are things that have influence and effects on on things you see every day. A ventilation perfusion mismatch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. For loads of different reasons, especially under anaesthesia, whether it's, you know, often it's positioning, isn't it? Posture, yeah, positioning, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, just the, the, there's this um, typical uh, sort of standard three compartment model um, for the lungs. If you take a take any lung um, and take the top third, middle third and bottom third. Um, and by top, I mean, you know, however they're positioned at that point in time, you've got a lung that is uppermost and a, and a part of a lung that's lowermost. And because of gravity, it's purely a gravity effect, you're going to get more um, pressure and blood at the, the lower part of the lung than you are at the top. Um, so at the top of lungs, you have um, you have relatively lower perfusion and you have relatively lower ventilation. At the bottom of the lungs, you've got higher um, perfusion and higher ventilation. Um, and in the middle, you've got something in between. And you've got this VQ that reduces as you go down the lungs. And, and you know, we're looking for that, that wonderful VQ ratio of one or thereabouts. Um, so at the top, it's slightly less and the bottom is slightly more. Um, so the lung isn't this homogenous mass that has this perfect VQ relationship all, all around it. Um, it's, it varies and it varies with you know, position in the lung. Um, and it, it's quite interesting to, to think, I thought, oh, well, the lungs that are at the top where the, you know, the ventilation um, uh, means that the, the alveoli are actually quite open because there's there's less pressure. Surely they'd be ventilated better. But the, what actually happens is because they're, they're more relatively open, they don't close very much. So they op only, they only open and close a little. And those at the bottom, where they've got all that hydrostatic pressure or increased hydrostatic pressure, tends to keep them more more compressed, but they're not collapsed. They got the potential to expand more and con con uh, constrict more. So actually, they contribute much more to ventilation than the ones at the top. And then you've got that gradient in between, and then you you have the potential at some point where the hydrostatic pressure, um, coupled with I mean other factors, may be that. They are that it's too great, and those alveoli tend to collapse. Yeah, and then you've got alveoli that, that have no oxygen exchange capacity. Um, so then, um, you know, that, that introduces a different VQ um, uh, situation. So, that, so the reason I'm talking about this is, I think, yeah, I know this is probably listened to by mainly small animal people, but but when you get to things like horses, where the 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 actual dimensions are so much greater, so the pressures are so much greater because the distances are, are greater. You know, you can have 50 centimetres of, of water pressure between uh, top of a lung and bottom of a lung because that's how, how how deep the chest is side to side, if you know what I mean. You've got an animal on its side or on its back. You've actually got those distances involved. So so these do start to have a big effect. And I think this is partly why VQ mismatch and, and shunts in horses are, um, are such a problem, you know. Um, and that would be true of, um, you know, large dogs as well. 
So one thing I think that, that tends to confuse people is is the difference between the shantana and um, and dead space. Yeah. So I think um, maybe maybe that's something to clarify then. So dead space is where you've got um, basically no perfusion. You've got alveoli that are expanding and contracting, but there's no blood going past them to pick up the oxygen at all. So as far as the the you know the a ventilation is concerned, that's that's just dead space, yeah. And a shunt is where you've got a bypass. You've got the, the pulmonary artery taking blood up to the lung and it's just passing through lung tissue, not picking up any oxygen, and then going um uh, out on the to the other side, back to the left side of the heart, without having, you know, picked up any oxygen. So that's a shunt. Um and I think when you've got those collapsed lungs, that's when we have shunt because we've got we've got blood coursing through um lung tissue that isn't expanding and contracting isn't um those alveoli aren't changing so we've got no oxygen pickup so we've got a shunt so so we need to keep those kind of problems in mind because they they do occur in small animals we may we may impose problems as well uh, we talked about ventilation but of course pulmonary circulation is not a high pressure system it's not the 120 millimeters of systolic pressure that we see in um uh, in the um, the right, uh, sorry, the left side of the, the system, we've got a much lower um, uh, pressure system in the lungs. So when we ventilate, we may even stop perfusion because, in some reason to the lung because the, um, the pressure that we're imposing in the lung tissue may approach or, or equal the actual um, peak pressure of the, of the pulmonary circulation. So then we actually are creating more dead space then because we've got lungs that aren't being perfused. So, I haven't thought of it that way. So, so we're saying if we put a high pressure into the alveoli, it's kind of like a tense balloon and it's, it's blowing up, and it's actually squishing the capillaries around around absolutely. the alveoli. That would normally, you know, you've got nice. I'm doing it with my hands. You've got this nice alveoli ball, for example, and then if you wrap your other hand around it, that's the capillaries and everything. Everyone's very happy, but when you well, up that alveoli and put it under a lot of pressure. Actually, it squishes all the blood that's around it, and it just can't. Um, it, it can't. Yeah, it just stops flow, so it, it, you know, ah. it, it, it can't therefore be ventilated part of lungs. So it now and now behaves like no, dead space. Because I was trying to think, what would have, what you know, what would an example of dead space be? Because I always understand that if we have this shunt, and that's that's because we've. Um, uh, we've got the blood going on the way to around the alveoli, but the alveoli is squished or something because of positioning. I'm trying to think, I was like, well, how can we get a dead space then? Maybe that's a clot in the lungs. Maybe that's a PTE. But actually, it doesn't have to be as dramatic as that. It could just simply be quite high high volumes of, of air in the lungs. Yeah, it could be It could be caused by ventilation. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Um, so other, other things we need to consider. So um, it just sometimes helps to think about this this sort of uh, the VQ mismatch because we talked earlier about hypoventilation. I think back in the last talk, talk number one on this series, we talked about hypoventilation. And if we had true hypoventilation, we could just increase our oxygen levels by um, you know, 21% to 30, 35%. And any effect of hypoventilation would more or less be removed because you get that, you get that 64 millimeters increase in in um, uh, oxygen um, partial pressure just by doing that. But the thing with a shunt is that no matter what you do, even if you increase your um, oxygen to 100 percent, you will not change the shunt fraction. Therefore, you will not improve your PO2 because it's just bypassing it. So it's you know if you've got um, something that's an animal that's got um, a poor PO2. And is on 100% oxygen, and it's not hypoventilated. You must have a shunt. And again, this is something that's very, very common in horses. Um, and then, what do you do about it? Well, you know, the shunt in horses is typically, you know, atelectasis. Um, mm -hmm. So you try and open up the lungs and and do recruitment maneuvers and what have you to try and improve things like that way. And there's lots and lots of ways of of doing that. And uh, you know this things with nitric oxide now, there's all sorts of very interesting stuff going on. So I'm trying to to rattle through my brain and, and I'm I'm getting some keywords flash up at me and I'm I'm hearing in my in the back of my mind, I'm hearing AA gradient. 
Mm-hmm. And that's something that we can do to figure out if we have a hypoxemia from hypoventilation or this venous admixture, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, that's our big, it's our, what is it, a capital A for the yeah, alveoli, for alveoli and, and a little a, a for arterial. arterial. And if we look yeah. at the gradient, we can figure out why our patient's hypoxemic. Yeah, so there's a normal sort of uh, accepted gradient, because there'll always be some gradient, because there has to be uh, for normal function. Um, I guess that normal gradient is 10 to 15 millimetres of mercury. Um, those are the sort of uh, figures we expect. So if it starts to exceed that, um, then there has to be a reason why, and it mm-hmm. could be diffusion. If it is, um, then if they're on anything more than 30, oh, sorry, hyperventilation, anything more than 30 or percent, oxygen, then it's very likely to be a shunt. Mm-hmm. And I, I haven't got the maths here or the, 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 the sort of um, um, equations in front of me, but you can you can calculate the, the, the shunt fraction from that alveolar difference. Oof. So if you know the shunt fraction and you, you, know, you try some different ventilation procedure and it improves mm-hmm. the shunt fraction, then you know that you're doing some good. But absolutely, this this arterial uh, alveolar arterial difference gives you a good indication of whether you've got a shunt or whether you've got hyperventilation. Because mm-hmm. if you've got high, you know, you've got um, a low PaO2, small AO2, so low arterial oxygen, um, but your your alveolar arterial difference is is minimal, you know, 10 to 15, then it's really got to be um, hyperventilation. If if it's the, if it's you've got plenty of uh, um, oxygen in the lungs, but nothing in or very little in the arterial, then, you know, it's going to be um, a shunt problem. Yeah, so, some yeah, reason you know. why that that nice, rich alveoli, oxygen-rich alveoli is just not getting into the, into the blood. Getting, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always a certain amount of shunt that has to be because we've got the... Um, We've got the venous drainage from the bronchial circulation and the cardiac circulation. Yeah, the, what's called the, the the Bezian veins from the from the heart draining into the back into the left side. So you know they they're obviously the hearts are very active muscles, so it's producing quite a lot of CO two. So so that's going to drain back into the um, left side as well. Um, okay, so how our lungs can be can be a problem? We, they can be. We just talked about diffusion limitations. You know. Um, the the thickened blood um, alveolar barrier. Um, we got the, the possibility of shunts um, and VQ mismatching because of um, changes in posture um, and and also um, hypoventilation. I think we did talk briefly about hyperventilation. We mentioned things like drugs affecting uh, ventilation. Obviously, I want to mention things like trauma. That may make it either painful or difficult to in, uh, t- for the chest to move or the diaphragm to move, um, and the the other one, which is you know paralysis, uh, hyperventilation could be due to paralysis. That could be to, to a number of things. It doesn't have to be us. It doesn't have to be us giving neuromuscular blocking agents. It could be things like um, uh, something. I think more in your part, where where you mm-hmm. came from, Courtney, um, tick bite and snake bite effects. Um, I've never seen a case. Uh, I've certainly um, been involved in trying to produce little ventilators to, to support these cases. So I'm a, li- I'm a little bit aware of some of the, the pathology that goes on. Um, but uh, you've seen, um, I th- it's interesting, I think, what, what, what you do when you're suspected tick bite um, paralysis. The, it's quite um, dramatic what you need to do, isn't it, to, to actually save these animals? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, these are horrible ticks and once they do bite and they do cause this paralysis and these patients come in very weak and, and struggling to breathe and it's it's all hands on deck. I mean, there is news in the same way in the UK and where actually everywhere else in the world you go hit by cars coming down, high rise fall is coming down. Everyone's there. Everyone's prepared. When we find out that there's this tick bite dog coming in, it's, you know, everyone's armed with clippers and it's quick. We are top to tail, basically nose to tail clipping all of the fur from that patient. And the reason for doing that is to try and find this tick. And you want to try and find these ticks on these big German shepherds. You know, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of surface area. So you, you just clip these dogs um, and they end up with a fantastic haircut. And then you are going through between the the 
the toe webbing, you're looking in the ears, you're looking around the muzzle, you know, you've got to find this tick. There's got to be a tick there. And it's very likely that these patients that present with this tick bite paralysis, there is a tick somewhere there. Mm. You just need to find it. And so you've got people simultaneously clipping this patient. Um, you know, you're swapping out blades quickly because you know how hot they get. Um, and then as soon as you've clipped them, have you found the tick or not? Have you removed it? You're also bathing them as well to try and get these ticks off. And then they they just need time really they need time to i guess metabolize and then recover so it could it could be 24 or so hours um but literally time is of the essence just as you've described before you don't have long if you're starting to hypoventilate and you're having problems getting oxygen in. you don't have long and these patients go downhill very quickly so it is literally it's quite dramatic to see them um just be clipped you know Almost like, you know, this poodle cut that you get where they have floppy mm. legs, but little naked little toes. That's like that all over the body. And you've got to find this tick and it's just everybody's involved. And and then to be honest, I was working in Queensland. So that was the sunshine state and it was hot. And I thought it was really hot working there. And I just think, oh, at least these nice German shepherds have got a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're, they've survived and they're they're cooler for the summer. But it's it's quite dramatic when when it's a tick bite case. And then if it's a if it's a snake case, then that's a different ball game as well. And I, I wasn't really involved with the management of the of the snake cases with. Um, giving them anti-venoms and then putting them on ventilators for days. But definitely with the tick bite paralysis, very quick, lots of haircuts, find that tick, get it off. Our patient is struggling to breathe. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that really is a good example of hypoventilation by paralysis, you know, and the effect of hypoventilation. Because there's nothing wrong with it. The lungs have got perfect structure, you know, mm -hmm. the, the heart is fine. Everything, everything is fine, but you've just got this paralyzing effect on the muscles so that if you can overcome that by ventilating them then you know you just have to ventilate them for however long it takes and i think as you said between one and three days um maybe more in some cases but you just keep ventilating them just on room air because they've got mm -hmm. no oxygen exchange problems they have just got a problem with hyperventilation um and i don't think we should underestimate the effect of hyperventilation uh, e even in our patients you know without tick bite uh, or snake bite problems you know the older dog um, you know, which is, which is struggling to breathe. It's finding you know, arthritic ribs and arthritic thoracic vertebrae painful, and it's breathing. That's work of breathing. They're going to tend to hyperventilation. So these, you know, these causes of of, of um, hyperventilation, they are out there, and we just got to be aware of them and, and the different causes. You know, pregnant dogs, obese dogs that you put on their back. We talked about this before. You know, you reduce their, their minute volume. They are hyperventilating. So, yeah. And I think I'm glad you said older dogs may be a bit more in pain and neck pain or or don't want to take these deep breaths or anything. But I have definitely seen hypoventilation as well in cases where we've done spinal surgeries. And I know some people will, will, might flick off their ears and go, oh, I don't need to listen. I don't do spinal surgeries in my practice. But let's make that applicable to you then. Because if we think about where those nerves come out of that innervate our diaphragm, so that's an the spine and the bicycle spine, let's not forget some of these dogs that get hit by cars or these cats that get hit by cars. Has there been some kind of trauma to their neck as well? Are they breathing okay? And, you know, of course, they've probably taken a whack to their lungs, um, to their whole thorax, really, but also, you know, swelling or fractures or trauma around the cervical spine as well could also make our patient hypoventilate. It's, it's, it's huge. It's such a huge topic. It's not just that mm -hmm. cold dog with opioids on board. It could be that hit by car cat. It could be that old dog as well. Yeah. Yeah, so I think you know these causes of um, of you know, things that affect the lung function um, are all real. So we've talked about, um, and I'm conscious of time passing. We've got lots of things uh, that we've already talked about. But we've still got lots of things to talk about. Um, one other thing I think we need to talk about. We'll just stay with the lung just briefly, um, just to put some figures onto some or give some sort of quanti uh, quantify some of the effects of or the, the procedure of actually getting blood out of the lungs. So the, it takes about three quarters of a second for blood to pass through the lungs, which is fine. If you look at the 
the uptake of blood, uh, sorry, oxygen to, to hemoglobin, you know, you've got plenty of time. Three quarters of a second actually is quite a long time. By the time it's passed through the lungs, it's actually going to be 100% saturated, you know, or as near as, you know. So it's not a it's not a limitation there. But when you get down to like a quarter of a second, then you're on the on the threshold of um, just having enough time for that oxygen to to um, fully saturate the hemoglobin molecule. So the difference between three quarters of a second and a quarter of a second is, of course, down to heart rate. So if you've got something that you've wound up and its heart rate is now, you know, many, many times what it was before, um, and you've got a, an animal that has a very poor oxygen reserve, um, you know, and possibly a small FRC, I think you probably see where I'm going with this one, so if you if you have a rabbit that you oh a rabbit okay a rabbit you know typically have a small FRC we discussed before poor ability to store oxygen in in its lungs because it's so small the FRC um, they do get excited they do get wound up their heart rates do get very high what you've just again done is force that animal into a very tight corner you've got a very short period of time for that. That blood passed through the lungs, you know, possibly less than 0.2 of a second now, maybe even less than that. So you're you're at a limitation now where the diffusion ability for oxygen to get from the lung to the blood is starting to affect the oxygenation of that patient. Also, there isn't much oxygen reserve there because they don't have a big FRC. So even though you pre-oxygenated them, they may be down to um, 21% or so or approaching that. So I think another reason why we've got to be very careful with rabbits and begin to understand why they are difficult um, anaesthetics and difficult animals to deal with because excitation is is you know often masked as well. You know you can they can have high heart rates but not actually be showing that externally. So I think it's something you know what I, lo I like about this stuff is that this physiology starts to match what we see in practice and it begins to explain some of these things that, that we see and why they happen, which then gives us the tools to, to combat it and, and, and deal with it. Oh, I just wish I had that in my brain, Keith. That was amazing. <laughs> when you started to say, you know, when when you wind these dogs up, I thought, oh, gosh, you've seen me before in the dog <laughs> ward hyping up these really old geriatric dogs. And maybe I shouldn't be doing that. And then you, you curveballed me and you said rabbit. And I thought, of course, it's the bunnies. Of course it is. And it makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. I used to think that that these rabbits, like the catecholamines killed, you know, I thought the stress did gave them arrhythmias, et cetera, et cetera. But there's this whole other factor I was not considering at all. And that was just the time of getting the oxygen into the blood to be used. Yeah. And I think it is probably catecholamine related. Obviously, that's going to have an effect on heart rate. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that they are on a bit of a knife edge, these these rabbits, when it comes to anesthesia for, for several reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just talking about how long blood spends going through the through the lungs begins to give you an eye insight yeah. into into why why they're a problem. Um, but but we should apply it to all animals. It, it can't be good to have a heart rate twice normal resting, you know, in any animal because that's going to have a, an effect on um, on, on the time um, on the time and, and I guess if it's the oxygenation, if it's pumping, 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 pumping as well. That needs more oxygen to do that. So it needs yeah, the more oxygen to work like that. Yeah, and then you've gone. Increased. Yeah. But we won't give you enough time to get it in. <laughs> oh gosh. Right. Yeah. So well, what we're worried about then, with you know, with the lungs, we're worried about hypoxia, aren't we? Okay, we're worried about not getting enough oxygen into that body, not getting. And hypoxia is only really going to be something that we notice down at the tissue levels. Um, so there are a number of forms of hypoxia, um, and I think it might be useful just to to talk about those different forms now. Um, so there's there's what we really what we just discussed there is hypoxic hypoxia, yeah, something that that means that there's there's not not enough oxygen passing into the blood to to result in the normal levels of oxygen in the blood. So we've got this hypoxic hypoxia. We've also briefly discussed this anemic hypoxia, mm -hmm. um, where we may have 
we have enough hemoglobin, but it could be bound up with carbon monoxide, or we may not have enough because they're truly anemic. They don't have enough red blood cells. So we've got an anemic hypoxia. It doesn't matter how much oxygen we give them, it can only carry so much. Even at you know, 100% oxygen, there just isn't enough dissolved in blood and carried by the anemic cells to give them what they need. So you're going to get an anemic hypoxia. Um, then we have this other condition called various names, but circulating hypoxia or perfusion hypoxia, where the delivery through the cardiovascular system is insufficient to certain areas. Uh, and it's going to be more localized rather than general. It's not going to be a general circulating hypoxia, otherwise that's, you know, that's terminal. But, um, you know, uh, areas where you've got restriction of blood flow for whatever reason, could be trauma, injury, could be pressure, um, you know, posture, uh, you know, these horses lying on hard surfaces during anesthesia, so you've got this um, regional um, hypoxia. Um, so we've got the circulating hypoxia. Um, and then finally, we've got hypoxia due to something acting on the ability of the cells and the mitochondria to actually um, respire properly. And that would be what we call histotoxic hypoxia and drugs like cyanide or, or other um, cytotoxic drugs. So there are four causes of hypoxia. So we can't just talk about, we can't say, oh, this animal's hypoxic. We have to say why it's hypoxic. Um, and, and there are the, I think we can more or less discount the, the histotoxic. We're not going to see that very often. Um, but the hypoxic, okay, not enough, uh, oxygen entering into the into the body, anemic hypoxia, plenty of oxygen coming in, but just nothing to carry it around. And this um, circulatory hypoxia where you've got something, I mean, I think as you mentioned in one of our discussions, Courtney, um, blood pressure cuffs, you know, mm. do create effective circulating hypoxia in that um, distal part of the limb because you are cutting off the circulation. So you are creating a transient hypoxia. And it's, I think if you look at... Um, uh, in hospitals, you'll often see um, warning signs about uh, the use of blood pressure cuffs in the intervals and, and the re repeat um, limitations. There, there are some very clear guidelines on how often you can repeat a, um, uh, a non-attended blood pressure cuff because it ha you know, if it's on every three minutes or every two minutes, that, that can be a, a problem. So there are some guidelines there. So we need to bear those things in mind as well. Um, so... This is, I think this brings another interesting point. So the body's quite well um, um, versed with, with sensing that hypoxia. It's got its, you know, carotid bodies and there's aortic bodies to look at oxygen levels. Um, but of course, we, I think we mentioned before, if we haven't, I'll certainly mention it now, that hypoxic drive doesn't really cut in when you've got a PO2 above 80 millimeters of mercury. Now we're looking for a PAO2 of 100 or so there, thereabouts anyway. So um, 80 is not, you know, not that far from it, but we are beginning to come, become hypoxic at 80. Um, but the, the body is going to do very little about it. And it's not until it actually gets down to less than 60 when it has this, this stimulus to breathe. Apart from, and I think you, you, this interests you, I think, Courtney, as well, these um, brachiocephalics. phallics. Yeah, I, I love talking about brachycephalic anesthesia and I always think these guys live their lives chronically hypoxic. So they live their lives just taking in lower levels of oxygen because they can't get it in. Um, and then they live their lives a little bit chronically hypercapneic and they just can't get that CO2 out. And that's just all to do with their pharyngeal tissue and the, you know, everything being a bit narrow and the resistance. And these are changes that you can you literally see if you take a blood gas sample of your brachy breeds and you run it through, like you will see it. You will there's studies published on the fact that they are just different. And this is why often we anesthetize our patients and um, we anesthetize these French bulldogs and they might not take a breath for some time. They might not take a breath until their kind of their CO2 gets to about, you know, if you think about the normal CO2 being 35 to 45 or and then the patients wanting to desperately take a breath at about 50, 55, whatever, anecdotally, these brachycephalic sometimes are happy until like 60, 65 millimeters of mercury of CO2. Um, and then also just trying to get them to breathe these French bulldogs, again, they don't want to really take that breath because they're used to that high CO2. They're like, sure, this is how I lived my life, a little bit, you know, a little bit sour like a lemon, a little bit epidemic. And then trying to wake up these brachycephalic patients as well. When we want to do our best by giving them flow by oxygen, 
to recover them because we look at their pulse oximetry and it's really low, but probably was low beforehand anyway. We can start to give them lots of high concentration of oxygen. So we can give them flow by or we can leave them attached to their ET tube for some time and have the breathing system attached. And actually, because of that really high concentration of oxygen, they probably, they're still, you know, they're going to have almost slower recovery because they think, oh, I've got so much oxygen for one. They definitely don't need to take a breath. What's triggering these brachycephalic breathe? breathing is no longer the CO2 anymore, but it's often the low levels of oxygen. So if you go and give them more oxygen, they often don't want to wake up or take their own breath. So it's, it's you know, like, are you trying to win? Are you losing? What are we doing with these guys? Um, but I, I used to hear throughout my career, oh, if you leave that patient attached to the breathing system, they probably won't wake up quickly or they won't want to take their own breath. And I thought, oh, that's so silly. Of course they will. Their CO2 will build up. But especially in these brachycephalic patients, their CO2 is already high. And actually, now that we go and increase their oxygen, their PaO2, they also just don't want to take a breath. Yeah, and I think part of that problem is is, is the step change from 100% to 21%. It would be quite nice if you could drop down to 30, 35. Then, you know, a, you wouldn't run the risk of hypoxia, because I think we talked about it last time. If you, if these brachies are, have got this, norm, uh, their reference, their normal range of, of end tidal CO2 is higher. We said before from the alveolar equation, you can only have so much in the lungs. If your CO2 is high, you can't have as much O2. Um, so if you're on 21%, there's a risk that you actually induce a hypoxia, which may make them wake up, but we don't really want them to make them hypoxic, truly hypoxic. So it might be better to have something like, you know, 30%, 35%, but we go from this this very high 100% down to 21 and there's nothing in between. Um, and I think, you know, maybe we should consider doing it, like you say, flow by, cannily, mask, whatever. But I think 100% to 21 is a step change, mm. is, is a is a problem or potential I'm not problem. sure if, if if it's effective or not but I felt a lot better by doing it but once I disconnected the breathing system from the patient's ET tube um, so that's I actually was fortunate enough to have agent monitoring so I could tell that they weren't expiring a bunch of isofluorine into the room that I was going to inspire so um, once they knew that they were no longer expiring lots of anesthetic gases and I just didn't need to have them attached to that breathing system I actually used to leave the breathing system about two or three centimetres away from the connection of the ET tube. The mm -hmm. patient's still intubated. And, I mean, I haven't done any uh, research on it, but I, I I wonder if I was safely being able to reduce the FiO2 for that patient. Well, not safely, just just change it slightly, not quite be just on room air. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's an interesting time. And these, these brachies, they are, they are quite a interesting mm -hmm. um, sort of physiological um, puzzle, aren't they? You know. They're exciting. I love them. I love yeah. anesthetizing them. I, there's so many challenges and you really have to think so differently yeah. and think, well, for one patient, that would be fabulous. But for this one, do I want to provide yeah. oxygen or do I not want to provide oxygen? So I did, I, I just for this is one of maybe our last comments. I think we've more or less come to the, to the conclusion of our, our talk today. But one thing I, I did read about um, a while ago was uh, the normal thoracic pump mechanism that we talked about, you know, uh, in on ventilation lectures, I think, or our podcast, um, you got this this thoracic pump mechanism where you, when you inspire, you create negative pressure in the chest and you aid venous return, and you, in, during that process, you're actually improving cardiac output. So, so the the the, the paper or the report that I read was um, suggesting that this has a tremendous benefit to the brachial phallus because they create because of their bad breathing they, you know mm. they create quite a, a profound negative pressure in the chest they're actually influencing their um, cardiac output and their venous return quite markedly by the thoracic pump effect yeah which is great isn't it until you intubate them oh yes yes and they're then, used and, to going Ugh. Yeah, and, create, and then you totally abolish, even if they're still spontaneously breathing, you've taken away a lot of the effort, which is great from worker breathing point of view and everything, but you have changed the dynamics of venous return and cardiac output in those patients. And if they're potentially hypovolemic, that could actually potentially be a problem. So it's just something Disastrous. to think about. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. I, 
I like having put those two bits of knowledge together now. Actually, that's that's yeah. very good. Very I, I have nothing. I have nothing other than this. <laughs> what I've read and theory to put it together. But the, mm-hmm. but you know, the physiology makes sense. You know, yeah, absolutely. While they're in that that stertorous and 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 you know struggling state, they're actually improving or helping their own cardiac output. And if you remove that, then it can have an effect. Probably not in the well individual, but the the hypervolemic shocked individual may be a may be a problem. So um, that's something to think about. So yeah, look, be, I think the thing to do would be to to monitor blood pressure really carefully at the, at the you know just post intubation and just make sure that you don't get a crash or anything like that happening. Mm, that's a good tip. That's very good. Yeah. Okay. I think um, I'm sure there's more we can talk about, Courtney. But we've gone from the lungs down to the to the to the mitochondria. Really, um, there's um, there's obviously a lot involved in going from one one to the other. But I think we covered a lot of it. Um, I'm sure there's more we can talk about. But um, I think we'll, we'll, we need to sort of call it a day there and think about. The next phase, which is going to be the more the more clinical, more hands-on um, phase. So, our next podcast, we're going to talk about uh, still talking about oxygen, but you know how we monitor it, how we um, look at a patient's oxygen status, how we deal with it, um, how we can you know affect its um, ventilation and things like that. So, we're going to look at the very practical monitoring side of oxygen next time. Yeah, to that. Yeah. Unless you have anything yeah. else to say this more uh, now, I think then we'll wind this this um, podcast up and um, and go and prepare for the next one. No, it sounds fantastic. I am really excited to talk about applying all of what we've just learned to actual hands-on monitoring with our patient. So that will be next. Great. All right. Well, I'll speak to you in the next one. See you later. Okay, bye, bye now. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Don't forget to follow our podcast to stay up to date with the latest episode and feel free to share with your team. If you have any questions or feedback for us or simply want to know more about what you've just heard, please send us an email to clinical support at burtons.uk.com. Catch you next time.